the servant of God, Francis Quinones, Cardinal and Confessor, First Order. Francis was the first child of a wealthy Spanish count and heir to a rich family estate. He was endowed with rare mental gifts. When he was scarcely 16 years of age, he attended the University of Salamanca. At the time, Father John of Puebla, who was also a count by birth, was introducing a stricter form of life in the Franciscan order. It was the subject of much conversation among the university folk. Urged by a sincere desire for perfection, Francis went to the convent of St. Mary of the Angels and asked to be admitted there. Father John himself joyfully received the innocent young man and gave him the name of Francis of the Angels at his investiture. This wealthy heir of a Spanish estate was henceforth seen clothed in a poor habit, cheerfully performing the most menial work and serving those who in the world had been his father's subjects. As soon as he made his profession, he went out to gather alms and personally carried to the convent the provisions collected. After his ordination to the priesthood, he devoted himself to the salvation of souls with the greatest zeal. His self-sacrificing spirit manifested itself in a special way when an epidemic broke out. Father Francis labored tirelessly in administering corporal and spiritual aid to the afflicted. He even carried the dead bodies, from which others feared contamination, on his shoulders to their graves. He ardently longed to go to America to preach the gospel to the Indians. But God planned another field of labor for him. Because of his extraordinary talents and outstanding virtues, he was chosen for the higher positions in the order at a very early age. After being chosen the head of his province several times, he was elected Minister General of the entire order in 1523, when he was only 38 years old. At this time, Emperor Charles V requested the Minister General for missionaries to the Indians in Mexico. Father Francis acceded to this request and sent 12 men, the celebrated 12 apostles, to undertake the work. When they left Spain, Francis wept because he could not accompany them. Meanwhile, he administered his office with unusual apostolic zeal. He made all his journeys on foot and lived in the greatest poverty. He did everything in his power to escape honors that others were so ready to tender him. Where he was not known personally, he would not allow his companions to disclose his identity or use his title in speaking to him. He could not bear it if honor was accorded him because of his noble descent. Pope Clement VII often called on Father Francis in negotiating with the emperor who entertained great affection for Father Francis. But when such business matters and the extensive journeys he had to make in the interests of the church prevented him from giving the necessary attention to the order, he resigned his office of minister general with the approbation of the Pope. He sent a last circular letter to the brethren in which he urged them to remain faithful, to persevere in their holy calling, and to look for no other reward than the one promised for eternity, according to the words of our Holy Father, St. Francis. Great things have we promised, greater are promised us. In 1528, the Pope selected him for the cardinalate. But even as a prince of the church, Francis preserved the simplicity and poverty of a friar minor. In the Church of the Holy Cross in Rome, to which he was assigned as cardinal, he had his tomb erected with the inscription, Francis Quinones, Cardinal of the Roman Catholic Church, mindful of death and corruption, had this grave prepared for himself during his lifetime. After accomplishing much good for the church and his order, and adorning himself with rem remarkable virtue and great merit, 
He died an edifying death in September of the year 1540. <clears throat> On humility amid distinctions. Consider how edifying must have been the humble disposition of the servant of God, Francis. He was never proud of his noble birth, of his high offices, nor of the distinctions that were showered on him by the highest dignitaries in the world. St. Gregory teaches that we should never accept honors and distinctions, except when they can help us be of service to others, while for ourselves we regard them as burdensome. That is what Holy Scripture tells us in a few words of the disposition of Queen Esther. She spoke to the Lord with reference to her crown, quote, Thou knowest my necessity, that I abominate the sign of my pride and glory, which is upon my head in the days of my public appearance. End quote. Esther 14.16 When honors are accorded you, do you find them burdensome? Consider how difficult it is to preserve humility amid honors and distinctions. Honor is so sweet a poison that it requires great virtue not to indulge in it and lose humility. It is much easier to endure humiliation with patience and to think in lowly fashion of oneself when one is in a humble position than it is to preserve humility amid honors. Saul remained humble while he was a shepherd, so that he could say to Samuel, who anointed him king, Am I not a son of the least tribe of Israel, and my kindred the last among the families of the tribe? 1 Kings 9.21 But after he had been made a king, he became so proud that he refused to obey God and was rejected by him. When we reflect on such examples, should we not rather fear honor and distinctions? Consider, however, that it is possible to remain humble even amid the honors that are bestowed upon us. We can do so if we refer all honor to God, from whom alone worthy actions receive their value. In the Apocalypse, St. John thus saw the elders placing their crowns before the throne to the Most High, while they said, Thou art worthy, O Lord our God, to receive glory and honor and power, because Thou hast created all things. Revelation 4.11 as regards ourselves, we should ever keep in mind our baseness, as did the servant of God, Francis, when as a cardinal he had his tomb prepared, mindful of death and corruption. If honors are bestowed on you, or you are appointed to a position of prominence, then remember, O man, that you are dust, and into dust you shall return. Genesis 3.19 Prayer of the Church. O God, who withstandest the proud and givest thy grace to the humble, endow us with that true virtue of humility, the pattern of which thine only begotten Son did show in himself to the faithful. Nor let us ever by our pride provoke thee to anger, but rather in our lowliness may we accept from thy hands the gifts of thy grace. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Servant of God, Francis Quinones.